Hey everyone, welcome back to another Ask GN episode. It's been a little while, lots of travel. If you have questions for next week's episode, post them in the comments below and we'll try to get to them for that video. Some of these are from our Patreon Discord. So if you don't see the questions from the comments from the last episode, that's because they came from our Patreon backers on Discord because I needed some new questions because the previous video was all rise and stuff and we answered most of that in the reviews. Before getting to this episode, this coverage is brought to you by EVGA and their FTW3 ICX card, which is a 1080 Ti ICX card, meaning it has the NTC thermistors attached all over the board so you can get uh, VRM, VRAM temperature readings, and additional GPU readings, stuff like that. Kind of cool. Check out the link in the description below for more information on that card. So uh, based on my vague understanding of what our upload schedule should be this week, in theory, we already have content up pertaining to this device here. If that is the case, then this first question is already answered, which was, does the switch still work? Asked by many people. And the answer is yes, for the most part. So it works well enough to do the thermal testing. We can play Breath of the Wild on it. Uh, it functions basically as expected. There are a couple extra screws that, uh, that were not extra when I took it apart originally, but otherwise it's in good shape. And you don't really need those anyway, apparently, because it's held together just fine. So yeah, that's good to go. First question is from Walter Favor, who says, why are modern games using more and more VRAM? The textures don't seem to look any better. Uh, and I believe added some extras. I have, I used to have two 770, two gigabyte cards in SLI, uh, which I could play Crisis 3 at 1080 Ultra without getting bad frame rate and running out of VRAM. I currently have a 290X, four gigabyte, and I now seem to be slowly going out of VRAM again. Why is that? Our game devs, <laughs> our game devs just becoming more awful at efficiently using VRAM. That's always a possibility, um, but not, not to slight devs just because the development environment is so insanely fast paced. This is why DirectX 12 and Vulkan is taking so long to get rolling because those low level APIs are really not trivial to program for, uh, which is a different question really. But, um, but same idea where optimization is not, a, not an easy thing when you're also trying to just make the game and get it out the door. But as for the, the kind of VRAM requirement, there's a few things here. The first thing to kind of mention, which I've done in the past in previous episodes, is uh, depending on how you're measuring VRAM, that number you're seeing might be misleading. So there are a few ways to do this. A couple of the games, like GTA V was one of the first we really praised for adding a VRAM bar in their options menu. That was pretty cool. A couple of companies are doing that now. I think Ghost Recon Wildlands included and The Division maybe. Um, that's, that's one way to look at VRAM consumption. That is going to be an estimate based on whatever the developers have put in there to estimate consumption. In theory, that should be pretty accurate. That's generally the maximum amount that would be consumed. Now, the other way, the more common way, would be to take a tool like GPU-Z and just look at what it says is being consumed for VRAM. Now, the misleading thing here is that all GPU-Z knows is how much VRAM is more or less being engaged, not necessarily used, just requested access to uh, by the, the applications. So an example would be, I think Call of Duty uh, Black Ops 3 is the game that we've tested a lot in the past. That one will look like it can consume 10 to 12 gigabytes of VRAM with a Titan X or something. In reality, it'll be just fine without that. But that's just because it's sitting there requesting all of it. It doesn't know if it's gonna use it or not. It's just saying, hey, give me all that memory you have. Uh, not necessarily actually using the memory. So depending on the tools you're using, the first part of this question, why are games using more VRAM, might just be that your cards have more VRAM and the tools you're using to look at consumption are saying that all of it's being used because the games are just requesting all of it, not necessarily using it. Uh, so that's part one. As far as actual usage of VRAM, I would say look at things like consoles. Now we have the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One or whatever it is right now, whatever iteration they're on, 1S, I don't know. But where the consoles are upwards of eight gigabytes of memory at this point. Uh, and that means that the developers have some more freedom to actually use more memory on the consoles as they port to PC. Maybe they don't optimize it as well, or maybe they are using more VRAM. That doesn't answer your why don't textures seem to look better question. I think that's more of a subjective thing. But I would say that consoles are one of the first places to look just because if you are building for the lowest common denominator, 
and that is now an eight gigabyte memory device, suddenly you can use a whole lot more VRAM than previously seemed permissible. And considering you're porting to maybe a PC where VRAM is pretty high and excess, well, VRAM and memory, because there's system memory too. We don't have the same limitation as, as consoles in that regard. Uh, you're gonna be able to build more complex images and textures and things like that. But as for textures don't seem to look any better, I guess that, that probably just depends on the game more than anything. Because uh, there are some games that look legitimately really good. But uh, yeah, so the, the answer in short is a few parts. It's one, how are you measuring it? If you're using tools that just say how much VRAM is being requested, then as you upgrade video cards, it will always look like more VRAM is being consumed, which you can test by running a game with a card that has four gigabytes, put another one in that has six or eight, put another one in that has more if you have access to all those, and you'll see that each time with the right games or the wrong games, more and more will be requested, uh, even though the game performance in terms of memory consumption might be the same. The next question is from Joe Gibbs, who says, Hey GN, a friend wants to build a new PC on Ryzen. He wants 32 gigabytes of RAM, and when asked why, he says he wants it to do graphic design. I think he should buy 16 and then maybe upgrade in the future if he runs out. Do you think 16 is still enough in 2017? And when should you go for 32 gigabytes? Uh, so the, the most immediate thing, what was this for? Graphic design. I'm not 100% sure what uh, that means, but depending on the software, the first thing I would do is say, take the current system and run the project that you're like a, a representative size of what you'll be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. For us, that might be something like Premiere. Run, in our case, Premiere or Photoshop or whatever, open a project file that would be representative, maybe get some Chrome windows or whatever in the background, just eat another thousand gigabytes of memory. So that's what Chrome does. And then look at your memory consumption and from there figure out, oh, what do I need for my next build? That would be step one. Step two, Ryzen still has some issues with supporting four sticks of memory. In theory, that should be kind of worked out going forward. I'm not 100% sure the details on it right now. There are more and more EFI updates coming from all the board vendors that, for the most part, almost, well, really like 100% of them right now, are addressing memory issues, memory clock or memory capacity or whatever. Uh, in theory, that support gets better. So first, first thing to do, see how much memory is being used currently. Uh, once you've kind of plotted that against some common use cases, then look at the options for Ryzen, if you need 32 gigabytes, keep in mind that generally speaking, more sticks of memory in some of the existing Ryzen platforms may mean that you run at a lower clock rate. If that is acceptable, for the most case, it, well, I guess it depends on what you're doing, but for the most case, it probably is. If you really just care about capacity and not speed, uh, then go for it. But if not, I would say, uh, just do some, some research on the platforms out there. The Crosshair 6 has gotten better and better almost on a weekly basis. They're like, I mean, they're pushing beta updates to us every couple days for EFI or for BIOS if you prefer. Uh, and that is generally improving memory support. And the same is true for the Gigabyte Gaming 5 board. But uh, yeah, some boards still have issues with four sticks of memory. Ryzen as a platform in general has some issues with memory, again, in general. Um, so make sure you do your research. The kits you buy may not actually clock to their advertised rate on the kit depending on, again, motherboard, EFI, chip in use, all kinds of stuff. And you can check Ryzen reviews, ours included, and a couple others as well. Legit Reviews has a good memory discussion. Uh, you can check those for more information. But the short answer, 32 gigabytes you can totally use in the right use cases. We blow through that in some of our projects with a lot of uh, warp stabilizes or uh, sped up time lapse type things. Um, so it may be worthwhile. The next question is from Street Guru, who posted this in our Patreon Discord. Again, patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you want to get in on that. Uh, Street Guru asks, also going to guess you'll have a Ryzen overclocking guide at some point, perhaps bring in Buildzoid to chat about it. Yes, that is the plan. I've been talking with Buildzoid about that. He's waiting for a motherboard still for Ryzen, and he's on another continent. So it's not easy for us to share parts with him. It's also very expensive to get them there. Um, so he should have a board at some point. It's just a matter of when they become available in that region. Uh, and we're hoping to contract them to, to help us out with an overclocking guide that's a bit more in depth than you might normally get. So that is in the plans, yes. Next question, Steve Streza also from Discord asks, why is VRAM a fixed component on the GPU? 
not user replaceable in parentheses, as opposed to CPU RAM, which is standardized and replaceable. I would say probably the, mo the biggest answer to that is going to be latency or size. Uh, VRAM is soldered, it's BGA, so it's got, I don't know, 100 and something, 170 pins maybe, uh, or 170 solder points. Um, so the ball grid array, it, it allows the memory to take less of a footprint on the PCB. That's item number one. That's really important. Uh, so being smaller, you can pack it in denser, which is important for a GPU where you don't have a full motherboard size available to you. Also, the latency is a lot better on something like GDDR5 versus DDR4 or 3. And that's really important for a video card where you're really trying to avoid ever talking to system memory if possible. You want to store as much game content as possible into the local memory. And that's because the latency is lower, which is because it is that BGA GDDR5 architecture as opposed to standard DDR4 that you put in a system or system memory in general. Uh, so that's the main part. The size would probably be the other one because if you can think about it, uh, putting on RAM size slots, that socket, onto something like this is, is not very uh, size friendly. You could do it with, I guess, something like laptop dims. But that's, uh, that's kind of how I read into that question. That's the basics of it. I don't, I don't know that I have a more in-depth explanation for you. Uh, next question, Dane of Starfall, also Discord, said, question for AskGN, how much of a quality difference is there in general between motherboard manufacturers and where is the difference the biggest? Sometimes it seems like all of the motherboards are exactly the same. Yeah, so I, I remember feeling the same way a long time ago. And in some regard, they are very similar. Uh, this is especially true as the CPUs have continued to pull things off of the board and put them onto the CPU. In the past, that would be the memory controller, the IMC. And then briefly, uh, it's kind of nebulous what's going on lately, but briefly, uh, Fiverr, it didn't completely remove the VRM from the board. You still needed it on the board, but having Fiverr on the chip did complicate some things in some ways and did remove some of the customization in some ways from the board vendors. So what happens? Well, they can customize in a few things. One is component quality. That's the biggest one. So just where do the caps come from? Where do the chokes come from? Who's making them? Are they any good? Because you can buy the cheapest FETs in China, stick them on a board, and it's not going to overclock as well, even if it has a ton of phases just because the FETs aren't very good quality. Uh, so that's, that's important, is how good are the components, the individual pieces on the board. The next thing is stuff like, I mean, standard stuff like I.O., that's of course a differentiating factor. It's not that exciting of one because it's not hard to change how many SATA ports are on it or how many USB ports are on it. That's more or less a PCH or chipset level thing and then you just assign the lanes to the device that you want as the board vendor. Uh, so that's one way. But more importantly, it's stuff like component quality, the VRM design. If you are buying something like, for example, a B350 motherboard, and you want to do a big overclock, you really need to make sure that VRM is good. Uh, because as I was speaking with Buildzoid, there are a couple boards out there where pushing a heavier overclock through a VRM that's simpler, uh, lower quality components is just going to generate a ton of heat and won't be as stable you might not be able to get as far, but definitely generate more heat uh, than on something like an X370 counterpart in the AM4 world where you might have better components or just more phases and better components, stuff like that. Other things would be small features. That's how they differentiate themselves these days. So that's stuff like software. Normally, I don't like motherboard software, but with Ryzen, AI Suite was actually really useful because the temperatures were very difficult to figure out in at least in the early days, it's a bit different now. Um, still in the early days, but not as early as then. Uh, so motherboard software, RGB lighting, if you care about that, that's a differentiating point. Um, but really, again, the, the big things we've kind of gone over. So short answer, yes, yeah, so they are pretty similar these days, but they still differentiate themselves. So hopefully you can find something out there that suits the needs based on price. Next question is, <clears throat> oh, that's right, I had a note here. Uh, EFI quality and options available also matters a lot with motherboards because uh, BIOS is where everything happens at a user level. So hopefully it's a good EFI. Um, and also audio hardware, that's one thing that they still have a lot of control over. So if you really care about audio and you don't want a sound card, consider that too. 
Mr. Derek has the next question asks, per, uh, perhaps as a GN question, do you foresee Intel becoming much cheaper in future as a result of Ryzen, specifically with X99 or 199 lineup that is? Uh, so I think, I think you're looking at the right place. Uh, I, would, I would guess that Intel, there's a greater chance of them modifying their Extreme Series X99 type or X99 Beyond products in terms of price or uh, stack positioning than their sort of uh, Z series enthusiast grade products. Because just in terms of competition, AMD is competing most heavily with Intel in that X99 class or whatever's beyond that. Uh, so that would be where I would expect price changes like the $1,000 6900K might drop. That would be where I would expect to see it or more likely whatever comes after the 6900K, its replacement because I don't know that they'll change the price this late in the lifespan other than maybe $50 rebates or something. Uh, but I would not expect to see a huge change today in something like a Z-series ready processor, like a 7700K. That seems to be pretty happy where it is. And generally that's about $330, $340, somewhere in there. Now, as for what R5 will do, that remains to be seen. <laughs> Depends on how competitive R5 is in its class. As I said on TGW, I was on Joker's show uh, hours before recording this. As I said on his show, the R5s, based on the specs and what we know about the R7s, really will, uh, will, will tear the i5s a new one for things like production, for Blender or Premiere. If you do it on the CPU and your alternative is an i5, then the R5s, in theory, wait for us to test it before you buy anything, in theory should be a whole lot better. In terms of gaming, that's a different story. We'll see. I, I'm not going to speculate on that right now. I kind of did on his show, but in terms of gaming, different story. Um, so it depends on what Intel's targeting. At the in the X99 class, those are really not good for gaming when you look at the price. The value is very bad for a 6900K, thousand dollar CPU. You're getting basically 7700K performance, plus or minus, depending on if the game cares about IPC or clock rate or core count or whatever. Uh, so those are bad value. So in that way, if it's a gaming targeted processor, like a 7700K, I don't think Intel will really care that much right now. But something like a production processor, like the 6900K, that is where it makes a whole lot more sense for Intel to change its pricing or its strategy for marketing or its next lineup, most likely like X199 or whatever they call it. Uh, that's where I think we'll see the changes. So hopefully that answers that question. That's all speculation but that's hopefully somewhat educated speculation. Uh, last question is from Donald G, who said, any chance that we can get a chart showing your cat's base speed versus overclocked on catnip? Maybe, uh, maybe Andrew can drop one of those charts in or something. So you'll have, you'll have that information for the future if you need it. So thank you for watching as always, patreon.com slash gamers to help us out directly. You do not have to post questions in the Patreon Discord for me to see them. I will check the comments of this video. Just used a lot of those this week because it was a while since the last one. So leave your questions below if you have them and subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.